So, so our next speaker cooking. is Jason Grout, who is all over Sage in lots of places and very early developer. When did you get started? 2007. 2007, yeah. So you will find Jason's fingerprints all over Sage in a lot of areas and uh, very helpful to me and linear algebra and some of the other things that I've tried to do. And I'm very interested in educational aspects of Sage. I could go on for forever. Jason. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a really fun ride. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, just briefly show some of the uh, ways I've been using SAGE in numerical analysis. So the disclaimer is that I've taken one numerical analysis class as an undergrad, an undergrad computer science major, and taught one numerical analysis class a year ago. So uh, these things are my first experiment with teaching numerical analysis. But I think uh, some of the things I'll show is our uh, are nice ways to use technology in the classroom, uh, and particularly some of the capabilities of Sage in the classroom. Uh, one of the things I should say about numerical analysis is that it's a great subject to teach because there's lots of real-world applications, right? There's you know missiles that hit bunkers and things like that because of problems with numerical analysis. There's a there's there's these applications that that catch the students' attention. And there's lots of surprises, lots of disabusing the students of notions that they've had since they were young, that computers were infallible and all sorts of stuff. And so you can start class with an example that they're like, oh yeah, of course that works. And then all of a sudden you move the slider and everything goes crazy and they realize, whoa, you know, all of these things I've thought about computers are totally thrown out the window. What's going on here? And it's an easy way to catch the student's attention. Um, the, on the, on the flip side, in numerical analysis, you can teach it also with a lot of theory, too. So it's easy to bore and, and lose the students. And this is part of the thing that I've been learning as I've been teaching numerical analysis. What's the right mix here? Uh, what I'm showing today is some of the classroom demonstrations and labs where I tried to concentrate on uh, engaging the students, disabusing them of notions that they may have had, you know, surprising them, in a sense. And, uh, and then a little bit, uh, a few more mundane uh, introductions to like numerical computing and things. So the first one uh, is a lab that we did first pretty early in the semester and uh, the idea behind this lab is I wanted them to sort of work by hand in order to understand about floating point numbers, work in a really small case, work by hand, um, but then to use the computer to help check their answers, give them confidence in their working by hand, you know, doing some binary arithmetic and things. Um, help have the computer help visualize their answers so they could see what was going on inside the computer and then help, gener help them have the computer help them generalize to real world life problems, size problems like double floating point precision. So, uh, and, okay, so how many people have taken numerical analysis before? How many people have taught numerical analysis before? Okay, <laughs> okay great. Um, so as you may know that uh, floating point numbers don't represent all real numbers because there's a finite precision. Um, in SAGE, it's, we wrap a, a world-class floating point library called MPFR and uh, expose a lot of capabilities from MPFR as well as uh, interval arithmetic capabilities from related projects. And so there's a lot of nice functionality to get down on the bit level in detail and explore numerical analysis. So here, for example, we can take the number one and this is by default 53-bit floating precision, and we can ask what's the number next above one? And of course, as a pure mathematician, you'd say you can't do that, right? But of course, in floating point precision, we can. And uh, I'll mention one thing that you'll need to know about numerical, uh, about doing these sorts of things is, uh, by default, Sage sort of truncates the numbers to give you sort of what's truly the number, and so you're missing some of the bits at the end that sometimes mean something and sometimes don't mean something. And you put this little dot str string, uh, truncate equals false, to give you the entire, you know, every bit that's in the number printed out here. Um, one of my projects when I taught this numerical analysis course was to make this sort of an option you said at the very start and then everything is printed using this sort of option. Uh, and we made some critical design decisions halfway through the semester, and so I need to sort of redo how I was doing that. But for now, we'll just put this, tack this little str truncate equals false. So of course, this is the number right above one, as any engineer would tell you, that, that uh, this is the number next, just above one. And uh, you can ask what this number is in base two, and you can clearly see, oh, this is one, 
And this is clearly the number of rent just above one because I increment the last digit, right? That's how things work. And this is the number just below one. Of course, in binary, you know, this is the equivalent of 0.9999999999, etc. And uh, really quickly, the students realize that there's a big gap between the numbers between the number just above one and the number one, and we can start talking about machine epsilon. And uh, so this is just a brief, okay, this is what happens when you're dealing with numbers in the computer, and whenever you're dealing with a number in the computer, it's actually representing a whole range of numbers. And okay, now we're going to talk the rest of the semester on what happens in this range of numbers and how this range can blow up and all sorts of things. So this is, so that's a, just a short, brief introduction, and then we get to this engagement, engaging work. So this is a lab that the students are sitting down at the computers with and uh, answering questions and working together, uh, working on a, on a much more restricted system that they can work by hand, so two binary digits and, uh, and two bits of the exponent. And uh, I asked them, first of all, list all the possible numbers. Just, you can calculate these things, they're not that hard. And of course, these things aren't evaluated. But you know, list them down, and then I actually calculate them for them, so they can check their works, and give them some confidence, and uh, we can also think of them as uh, rational numbers here. <coughs> but then we can plot them, and the li nice thing about plotting, visualizing these numbers that they just worked out by hand, have some sort of intuitive sense for these numbers, is it, it, it's really surprising, right? Right off the bat to these students that oh wow, what in the world's going on here? And there's a lot of questions that you can ask about a, a picture like this. So they're unevenly spaced. What's up with that? But then you notice that in between every power of two, there's the same number. Okay, hey, why is that happening? And a lot of the computer science majors are already starting to, to catch on to the pattern here that we're dealing with, counting in binary here and, and exponents. And there's a reason why we have unevenly spaced numbers, but in a sense, they're evenly spaced between the powers of two. Um, there's no float machine number representing 1.1, but your user puts in 1.1, so what should you give back? What number, what you know, point should you use for 1.1? And so we're starting to ask the students to think like a computer, or more appropriately, think like the IEEE 754 designers back in the 1980s and decide what do I do in this situation? And uh, understand what, you know, how, why would you choose that? Tell me, tell me what your reasoning is. And uh, the gap around zero, this is a common thing, I mean, look, there's a lot of numbers that are close to zero that we'd like to represent, but you know, there's a problem here. There's no, nothing there, so how do you deal with that? And leads into a, a short discussion of subnormal numbers, and why do we have that gap in our system? Uh, another question. Okay, so now arithmetic, of course, this is standard floating point sort of stuff. Okay, we know this is exact arithmetic. What happens if you actually try to do this on the computer? So, I mean, round, five sixteenths, round one fourth, subtract it, and then round the result. And you know they're doing these things either visually with the points or you know their table of numbers that they have listed in their notebook or up on the sheet. And they start realizing, oh, this is where we have numerical rounding issues and how rounding error gets propagated. And you know another question about rounding error, et cetera. And another question, I mean this is always a problem with students, right? You take point one and you add it to itself ten times and it doesn't equal one. What's the problem here? So we ask them, okay, so 1.1, you can't represent it, but you've decided how you're going to represent 1.1. What if you add it three times? What do you get? Do you get something close to what you, ex what you uh, uh, plan to get, or does the round off error accumulate? So these sorts of questions are starting to engage the students and involve them in a small system uh, with understanding the issues that we're going to be exploring the entire semester. Excuse me. So yeah. if you have this, these blanks that say answer? Yes. What are those? Okay, so the point is that they can double click oh, got it. and write their answer in. Yeah. yeah, so I should say something about um, how I found uh, an effective way I found to do labs. So if I did this in linear algebra. I didn't actually do it in this course, but next I, I put it up like I you know, want to do it next time. Um, in linear algebra, I would assign projects as worksheets, and then they would just save a copy of the worksheet. and. You know, click on the upper left, so edit a copy, and then they would have their copy of the worksheet. They would go through, and I would have, you know, question, blah, 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 and a bunch of sage cells, and then answer, colon, double click here to type in your answer, and then double click and type in their answer. All their computations sort of figured it out were up here. And then after they finished with the worksheet, save it, and then share it with a special account that I'd set up, like Linear Algebra Spring 2011 or something. 
So they share it with that user, and then later on I can come through and uh, just log into that account. And there's all their worksheets and the timestamp, you know, when they turned it in. You know, share it before midnight or something. And then I can look at their worksheet, and I can not only grade it, but I can actually make comments on it, you know, change the font to red and, you know, make a comment or two. Um, the nice thing about that is even before they turn it in, I have, I've had students, you know, I'm getting an error, and sometimes it was my error, sometimes it was their error, but they could share the worksheet with me early, and I could go in and, you know, just over email, you know, say, oh, okay, share the worksheet with me, and go into the worksheet, oh, you missed a semicolon, so put in that semicolon and, you know, type back an email, okay, I fixed it, there was a semicolon that you were missing right here, or whatever. And uh, so this sharing makes it really nice to interact with students. Uh, you just sent me a lot of work. I, I never okay. thought of that, so I've seen all these files in my... Yeah, I've done that account. too, and I was like, nah, I can't no, do that's this. Right. That's right. You don't want to have them share it with your personal account, though, because it clutters up your account and it's really hard to like unshare lots of worksheets. But you set it, set a specific account for turning in worksheets and have them share it with that, and it seems to work out well. And the blanks for the sage, so they would also those are for showing any computations that they would sage. That's right. Um, okay. There's there's two reasons why I put blanks. So in linear algebra, I would ask a question, then make you know ten blank cells so that they didn't have to like create new cells if they didn't want to. And then put you know answer colon. Here I just put a blank and uh, blank cell in between. Um, part of the reason is so that they can put computations in, and part of it is to work around a problem right now in Sage and the, and the data, the, the worksheet format in Sage, and that is, uh, anytime you have two text cells that are together adjacent, the next time you open that worksheet, they'll become one text cell. So it concatenates text cells, and this is just an artifact of the format that we use for the Sage notebook. So typically, if I have two logically separate texts, I'll put a compute cell in between them to sort of keep them separate. Oh. And so I end up with littered, you know, compute cells littered through, but you know, I don't know, it's okay with me. And so we, <clears throat> and we're actively working on changing this format to support adjacent text cells that we've just named. Okay, so rounding modes. I mean, <coughs> students love it when a professor says go to Wikipedia, right? So go to Wikipedia. It has a really nice article on rounding modes, or they can go to their book. And then we can talk about rounding up, rounding down, rounded nearest, rounded nearest if, you know, if you're even, you know, whatever. Um, and so I ask them, okay, for each of these, what's the, what's, what is 3.25, which is, which is one of these numbers that's sort of right in the middle. In order to do this, they need to go back and look at actually the binary expansion for 3.25 in their system, et cetera. And actually, Sage can do computations in the real numbers with round up or real numbers with round down. Uh, if instead up here, well, let's see, is there a good guide for this? Yes, for the prep workshop, we uh, put a little numerical analysis quick start that I can that I can uh, publish, but it, it's easy to say, do all your computations in a system where you always round to the nearest, round up to the nearest binary, or round down to the nearest binary floating point number, et cetera. And so they can check their work actually with this sort of thing too. Relative error, we've talked about relative error, as in calculate relative error of uh, what the approximation is for 1.1 and actually what 1.1 is, and uh, the maximum relative error, and, and uh, do this for a couple of numbers, and of course the relative error it changes because these numbers are not evenly spaced through the through the uh, number line. Uh, what's the pattern you find? So this is a little bit of investigative work, and then we talk about machine epsilon, machine epsilon being uh, maximum relative error between one and the number right above it, and, and so these are sort of setting the stage for conversations throughout the course. Now this machine epsilon actually asked them to do it for a 53-bit uh, number, so so double precision number. Uh, and then we can have Sage actually calculate the machine epsilon here and, uh, and, and sort of check their answers, et cetera. So this is generalizing it to the real world problem. And then I mean, we talk about some of these real world uh, applications, these real world and tragic, tragic events that happened in real world because people weren't paying attention to floating point error. Um, but, but that's not the topic for today. So I'll leave that to, uh, to a textbook or, or your discovery. I'll say Eve. Uh, his last name. Even on the, in the prep workshop this semester, uh, this summer, uh, there's a, a person that's been. Uh, Ever Evergelt, Ever yeah. Um, he's been doing. A, he apparently like memorized the entire last 40 years of Comap journals or something. I don't know. He, he's <laughs> always coming up with, 
oh yeah, well here's an app application from you know Comap that you know deals with uh, the World Trade Center floor is falling, or you know here's an application, blah blah blah, and he's got these great worksheets that he's been publishing on the Prep Workshop uh, website, and he says that we can sort of take and use whatever, so uh, maybe we'll post some links to those with permission. Okay, so that's a lab that seemed like it worked pretty well with the students. They got their fingers dirty and they got to uh, you know, sort of really understand what's going on under the under the hood here. Um, here's a, so the next couple of ones are more classroom demonstrations. So they help guide and uh, encourage discussion in class. Uh, these are, these next two labs are sort of disabusing them of notation, notions that they might have had uh, throughout throughout their life. So we're going to talk about finding roots. And to start off, there's a little uh, a function that basically does the next above a number of times. So it gives you all the you know, 20 consecutive numbers after one in 64-bit, or 53-bit double precision numbers. So uh, here we have, let's see if we print them with this, the truncate equals false. Here's the clearly the 20 numbers just above one according to engine engineer. Um, there you have. Okay, so we have a polynomial here, and uh, we factor the polynomial, and we clearly see that there's a root at two-thirds. Okay. In fact, there's three roots at two-thirds. And uh, we can plug it in and ask Sage to calculate it exactly, and yes, f of two-thirds is, is zero. Okay, but then we say, well, let's look at floating-point arithmetic, so we construct the double precision floating-point number. Um, you'll notice that I've done a couple things here. I use RR, which is Sage's real numbers, 53-bit precision real numbers, and I've put this thing in quotes. The reason why I put it in quotes is because I don't want Sage to interpret it as a floating point number and then convert it to the precision that I want. Instead, I want to uh, this guy, the 53-bit precision, to just get a string and actually just interpret that string as a 53-bit precision floating point number. It's not a big deal here. But it is a big deal if you say 100-bit precision. You don't want to just type in a number and have it interpreted as 53-bit and then convert it to 100-bit. It's much better to specify a string that's then just taken literally as a 100-bit precision number. OK, so I, I put in a number that's clearly not 2 thirds, even by engineering standards. And uh, I ask what f of a is. And of course, it's 0, right? And uh, this is a problem. This is a big problem, right? This should not be a root of this polynomial. So what's the problem? Well, okay, maybe it's just a problem, you know, just a you know a glitch in the computer, some cosmic ray. Okay, so we'd say, well, let's look at the 20 numbers above this number that really is not a root. Let's just check right around this number. And here's a short table. Uh, Jane will recognize the syntax of the HTML table, which actually is going to get uh, easier in this next release. Thanks to Jane's uh, comments, we, we put something in Sage to make this a little bit easier. But the point for the students is. Uh, each one of these trues represents a root of the polynomial. And so this is clearly not an isolated incidence of uh, cosmic rays. This is, this is like the computer's messing up a lot in this situation. And of course, this table's pretty impressive, but maybe we should just graph it. So here's a short graph. And this is what the polynomial looks like to the computer. Root, not root, root, not root, root, not root, et cetera. You can see there's a huge number of roots there on the, on the number line. And that is a lot of roots for a cubic polynomial that's supposed to have a repeated triple root somewhere way off this graph. Um, so what's going on? And this is, this is there. so of course the students are at this point in the semester saying, ah, numerical precision, but we just talked about Horner's form. We can get around that, right? So there's a way to evaluate a polynomial to be more numerically stable. So, so this is one notion of students that you know this polynomial has triple roots, and of course the computer knows that. Bam, gone. You know, there's something really wrong here. The computer's doing something really wrong. Okay, well, we know how to solve this. Horner's form. Okay, here's another notion. So we write it in Horner's form. Uh, let's see. Same example written in Horner's form. Here it is. Uh, we, uh, yeah, so here's it written in Horner's form. Here we factor it just to make sure we still have this root of two thirds. Sage still agrees with exact arithmetic that the root is two thirds. We do the same sort of thing. Uh, yes! Hornish form says that this bad number that we had before is now not a root. That's perfect. Okay, so let's just double check. And uh, how many trues do we have here? Oh, man. You know, there's still problems going on. There might be a few less trues, but this is exactly the same table as above, and we're still seeing 
multiple roots. And in fact, this is what the polynomial now looks like to the computer. Okay, so there's maybe a few less roots, but clearly this polynomial is pretty crazy. And in fact, if you graphed it out, this is what's happening on your calculator when it tries to graph things. Well, your, your calculator can't graph uh, things this, this fine. But this is what the polynomial looks like to the computer. And this is a cubic polynomial with a root way over, triple repeated root way over here. And, uh, and so Horner's form, ah, that doesn't work all the time. And so now we start talking about why repeated roots are bad. And so we shut off the computer and have a classroom discussion at the board, et cetera, about why repeated roots are, are particularly bad. Because if the polynomial gets too close, it skims too close, and so this rounding error you know, hits the axis too many times. And uh, so we have two notions here that are sort of the computer helps us see where the computer is failing. Okay, so all of these worksheets I should mention are published right now on sageandb.org. In fact, they're at the top of the list of uh, the published worksheets on sageandb.org. And thanks to William for getting sageandb.org in a usable state again so that we can use it here. All right, so the third example is a similar example uh, where we're going to uh, take a, a notion of the students. Uh, this is an even more advanced notion of instead of roots, we're going to talk about approximation of polynomials or approximation of functions using polynomials. So all these students have been in Calc 2 and Calc 1. Uh, let's see, whenever Tater, I guess Calc 2 and Tater polynomials are, are, uh, are done. And uh, if we, uh, uh, so I did the, oh, hold on just a second. Probably gonna have to re-authenticate. I think my 12 hours are up. S-U-O colon K-Z The only time on YouTube you're going to hear the password spoken while the instructor types it in. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So let's see. Let's go back to... Uh, let's see. We did repeated roots. Ah, yes. So it's back. That should be still there. Okay. You can see when I went home last night, apparently. <laughs> Twelve hours ago. Okay. Let's see. Oh, we probably evaluate it, and there we go. Okay. Evaluate this. And so uh, the goal here is to uh, approximate 1 over x. Okay. So approximate 1 over x using Tater expansion. And, uh, and what we're going to do is approximate it at 1 and look at the error at 3. Okay. And we can see the error is pretty bad. I mean, the error is 1.3. Okay, so first thing, you guys have been in Calc 2. What do you do to get a Tater expansion that's a better approximation? <coughs> Obvious answer is increase the order, right? Yeah, to go to go more turns. Okay, fine. Let's go more turns. Oh boy, our approximation now is ten off, right? And then you know, the classroom discussion where we realize that uh, you know increasing the order is actually doing us no good. It's doing us negative good here. I mean, it's 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 clearly that's not the right thing to do. And so all of a sudden we have this discussion about what happens when you concentrate your approximation, all your accuracy is concentrated around one, you know, and, and it's causing problems here. Okay, so how do we avoid this? How do we take care of this? Perfect segue into Lagrange polynomials. Uh, let's see how many people are familiar with Lagrange polynomials. Okay, so the, okay, the idea behind Lagrange polynomials is instead of uh, having uh, the function value plus the first derivative plus the second derivative plus, you know, however many derivatives you want equal at this one point. Instead, we're going to pick a bunch of points and say you have to have the function value at all of these points. So it's in a sense spreading out your accuracy here. And uh, we go through a short discussion of how it works and some graphs. I mean, here's sort of the basis functions for Lagrange polynomial. The idea is you want uh, the function, the polynomial approximation to be exactly equal to your function at specific points. And so you sort of construct a linear combination of these functions. Uh, you know, so these functions are a set of functions such that at the points that you care about, so in our case, with integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, exactly one of the functions is non-zero. And that non-zero function is 1. So you just say, well, I want 
the value to be 3 at 1. So f of, f of 1 is 3, then you can multiply this function by 3 and add it you know, as a linear combination, and you're, you're guaranteed that your polynomial is going to be 3 at 1, because it's 3 times this function you know, plus linear combination of these, which is 0. So you do this. So we have a short classroom discussion sort of visualizing these basis functions and understanding why they work and uh, putting together the Lagrange polynomials, et cetera, and, uh, and so anyway, a 20 minute discussion later or whatever, uh, we have a function that uh, constructs the Lagrange polynomial uh, approximation for one over x. Okay, so then we look at it again and we say, well, the error is, well, it should be zero, right? Because I've specified that I have to be equal to my function at, at three. Uh, but even if we take out three and say, well, uh, but if I didn't specify it had to be exactly equal to 3, oh, now we're pretty close to f equals 3. Okay, so this is a motivation for Lagrange polynomials and a short discussion behind the, of the theory behind Lagrange polynomials. Okay, Lagrange polynomials are the best things in the world. Okay, let's take that notion. Here's an example of the Runge function. It's actually a family of functions. And we go down here and you don't have a short discussion, but, uh, but we realize, okay, let's take, this is Lagrange polynomial. The green thing is the Lagrange polynomial for this function, and uh, what happens to the error here? You know, it's pretty good right in here, but uh, error is pretty bad right here. So at 0.995, close to 1, uh, we get an error of 81,000. Okay, so Lagrange polynomials are not the answer to everything. And it turns out that uh, actually what the problem here is evenly spaced intervals. Actually, the problem is much more clearly understood in complex analysis, as Mike Gage helped me understand a couple of days ago when I showed this. Uh, if you have complex analysis, you can talk about interval of convergence and things like that. And once you step outside this interval of convergence, your approximation just goes crazy. Um, and, and, and that's something that maybe could add it, be added to this discussion if your students are, you know, can, can stand a five-minute digression into complex analysis. Uh, but the point here is that these points are evenly spaced, and so we say, well, you know, it's not just we have a tool, but sometimes we uh, need to use the tool properly, and so if we use a different set of points, so this is a set of points, if you take a half circle, and you even with space points along the circumference, and then project those points down, we're dealing with stuff that's involved with Chebyshev polynomials now, uh, your approximation becomes much better. Okay, so Lagrange polynomials are not the be all and end all of things, and of course we knew that, uh, but it's helping the students realize that even when something's better, and we say it in classroom that it's better, it's not the end of the story, Sometimes you have to be even more smart about the like, points that you pick and things like that. And so picking better points gives you a much uh, closer approximation. And what this is doing is in complex analysis, apparently, there's some articles out there about that I haven't read yet, but uh, it's, it's changing the interval of convergence so that uh, you don't blow up as far or something. Anyway, so again, the idea of here's a notion that they've had. Let's show them that, well, you know, that notion is true and fine for restricted circumstances, but here are some places where it really blows up. Let's investigate why, let's investigate how we can fix it. But even with the fix, you know, here's a place where the fix goes wrong. Okay, and how do we investigate that? So it's helping them understand that computers are not infallible, and there's a lot more than Calc 2, you know, what they've been taught, the first word on uh, understanding computer arithmetic. All right, the next three are sort of uh, a little bit more mundane uh, presentations. Uh, one nice thing about SAGE is that you can write Fortran code in SAGE. You, know, you can evaluate Fortran code. This is literally uh, Carl, uh, Carl DeBoer's, from his book, uh, Guide to Practic Practical Guide to Spline. Basically, I've cut and pasted this straight from Netlib. This is the Netlib function. So in my class, we talk a lot about computational stuff as well. I, I think it's, you know, it, it's a sin to not mention Fortran at least once in numerical analysis. Uh, so I cut and pasted this straight from Netlib. Here's Fortran code, and I made two changes, and I put what, what I made the changes, and I, in Sage, I can evaluate this, and it calls a Fortran compiler, it compiles a Fortran module, but not just that, it compiles a Python interface to the Fortran module. So now I can call this Fortran function straight from another Sage function, uh, straight from an, another Sage cell, as a uh, Python function. And it does more than that. It even gives me the normal Sage help. So this is pulling the Sage help straight from, uh, so this is using a, a tool called F2Pi, I think, right now. And they're rewriting uh, the next generation. It's called, they're going to be called FRAP. And 
it'll be really exciting when they get this done, but this is just sort of automatically wrapping Fortran functions in Python and gives you all these nice things, like tells you what the, what the arguments are and everything. So the point behind this is we were talking about splines, but also that I wanted to show them a little bit of Fortran code, see how they can show them how to interface with some of the Fortran code, gives them a little bit of experience with this. And so uh, I've just I've told them how to interpret the arguments and everything, and, and we don't necessarily go through this in class. We, you know, this worksheet's published at the end of class. This is another reason why I like to do Sage in the classroom. I'm working through class, you know, they might have a question, so I open up a cell and do some work, et cetera. At the end of the class period, I go up to the top and hit save and publish, and then they can immediately walk to the computer lab or wherever that, later that night and see not just what we started class with, but the running commentary and calculations and the things that we were working through in class. Um, very, very easy to sort of post in class notes. Um, so I've just given them an example of how to call this function. Basically, this is what you would do if you were calling this function from Fortran, how to interpret the result as a polynomial, et cetera, and then draw in a nice picture you know, of the spline. So this is a, a spline is a, a piecewise, uh, I guess, cubic function where you insist that certain derivatives and things match up at the endpoints, so it's sort of really smooth. Um, again, this is not the classroom discussion, but we don't go through this in detail in the classroom. This is more of take home. But this is the classroom thing, is this little nice interact that we've built that actually calls this Fortran function and lets us explore different uh, different variations on splines. So I can, the knots, these are the uh, blue points, these are the points that the spline goes through, called knots. Um, and this is the boundary condition. So here I've said that the first derivative has to be zero and the at the starting point, and the first derivative has to be zero at the ending point. And so this PPP, PP pack function that's on that lib lets you specify all these boundary conditions. But we can talk in class, this is the main focus of the class discussion, you know, theoretically what the splines are, et cetera, on the board, but now we can sort of just play around with them. Or maybe we could do this and then do the theoretical discussion. You know, I can say, oh, I want the second derivative to be zero at the starting point. Or I want the second derivative to be zero, or the second derivative to be two at the starting point. And behind the scenes, this is, uh, or, okay, second derivative to be zero. Oh, okay, so maybe I want the first derivative to be zero. Uh, is it not updating? Anyway, so we play around with the numbers and we, we see examples of these boundary conditions that we've talked about in class. And, uh, and to do this, we're actually calling the Fortran function. So a little bit more mundane, not as you know, flashy or showy for class, but still a good solid use of technology in, in the classroom. All right, another, again, solid sort of use of technology. This is more, uh, more for the lab. I just want to show them the pack, of course. Mention, always mention LAPAC when we talk about numerical linear algebra. And this is the same flavor as the Fortran thing. There's, Sage includes a copy of LAPAC, of course. It's part of the NumPy or SciPy library. NumPy library. And uh, we can actually access the LAPAC functions directly uh, using the Python interface. And here I've just uh, shown them how to call a LAPAC function and how to interpret the results and how that corresponds with uh, what we've talked about in class and, and what Sage gives us back. There's a little convention switch between what Sage gives us back and what the pack gives us back, but here we're just calculating PLU uh, decomposition of a matrix and just calling directly the D get out or F function from the pack. Again, this is not something so much we go through in class, but something that I publish out there as we talk about numerical analysis uh, and matrix linear algebra, and then you know, there's some sort of assignment about PLU decomposition that can see an example of it. And again, here is sort of an aid rather than a focus in class. This is talking about iterative methods for solving systems of equations. So the Jacobi method, the SOR method, the gauss seidel method. And uh, we start off the discussion with a short uh, uh, discussion about eigenvalues and spectral radius of matrices, which is the largest absolute value eigenvalue, the, the, the largest eigenvalue and absolute value. And uh, talk just briefly about, you know, so here we have a matrix. We look at the eigenvalues. You know, the spectral radius is two because the, that's the biggest eigenvalue uh, with absolute value. And we look at, okay, so what's, what are sort of iterative powers of this matrix? And we can see that the matrix sort of just really blows up. And uh, in fact, if we look at uh, 
a to the k norm 1 over k, we notice, oh, you know, that number looks familiar. We've seen that before, and there's a theorem out there that says this should be somewhat close to the, this converges, I think, to the spectral radius. But again, we're not doing a heavy theory at this point. We're just sort of exploring and saying, oh, the spectral radius is related to what the powers of the matrix do, what the entries of the power of the matrix do. Uh, here we take another matrix. Uh, we calculate various uh, powers of this matrix, ask the students what's happening as we take powers of this matrix, and the clear answer is things are getting smaller. We look at the uh, spectral radius, or first we look at the thousands power, of course things are getting really small, we look at the spectral radius, oh it's one half, and we can do a brief discussion about how the matrix, uh, the powers of the matrix converge, the entries converge to zero if the spectral radius is less than one. So this is sort of leading an investigative discussion that leads into sort of a more theoretical discussion. And then uh, we talk about various methods, iterative methods for solving uh, systems of linear equations, and there's ways you can motivate this by, you know, we don't want to take a lot of memory to solve this huge system, et cetera. We want an iterative method that sort of runs a lot faster. But then uh, the point is that we can visualize these methods. So the point is that we started right here as a guess for our solution. The solution really is up here. And uh, these various paths represent what points the various methods give you. So here's the sort of, this is the Jacobi method and sort of just takes its time. You know, each point is an iterate, takes its time getting up here. Here's the gauss seidel method. And here's the SOR, successive over relaxation method. And students sort of get a visual understanding of this sort of really complicated matrix calculation that they're doing. Uh, that, oh, I like the purple one. You know, it just sort of like gets right to the point instead of messing around and wandering around like the Jacobi iterators do. So again, uh, this is sort of just to enhance the classroom discussion with some visualization and some investigation, or, you know, calculation, uh, and, but there's also you know, a whole other component of the classroom uh, during this discussion. So there's uh, six examples of how I've used SAGE in, in linear algebra and numerical analysis in my class. I think that's it. So questions? It seems to me in this talk you came up with things that some things that would apply to more than just linear algebra, but just teaching. Sure. For yeah. example, the separate uh, account where students should could share, right. you know, commenting stuff in it's right. red. Okay, right. you could publish accounts. Right. You know, I'd be interested in hearing. Uh, again, yeah, not from you, but almost from everybody on these right. little tricks, because some of them, I, you know, would make our life easier using Sage to teach a course. Right. Yeah, I tried to, yeah. When I gave my talk, my philosophy was I'm teaching how to use, how I've used technology in the classroom and specific examples for numerical analysis. So yeah, that would be good. In fact, it might make a really good discussion uh, at some point today, using, effectively using particularly Sage with the general technology in the classroom. <clears throat> Is there any inclination for the students to sort of express themselves a little bit more about how they maybe understand or not understand or have any comments about while they're doing the homework and stage? Um, Is that something I, that you promote? Or? Yeah, so I, I've only taught it once, so I don't have a control, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have any comparison. Um, it'd be interesting. If, I mean, it seems to me yeah. it would be really easy for them to be like, you know, you know, this looks interesting or something. Yeah, yeah. we didn't add some more to it somehow. Right. I, had, I certainly had some students. It was also my first experience, one of my first experiences teaching an upper level course at my university. And so I, I was learning how prepared the students were for the course. And, and, you know, there was lots of other things associated with, you know, teaching the course for the first time. And uh, certainly, you could, certainly you could make that. I've tried to ask students from the abstract algebra exercises I've given them to write a paragraph about what was going on or you know, to, to fire up the tiny MCE editor and write complete sentences and mm -hmm. thoughtful things. And it's hard to it's hard, yeah. you really gotta force them to do it and you know you get phrases instead of complete sentences. But you just gotta push it. Setting expectations. Yeah, expect, you you set your expectations. Right. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have a, a lab time that you that you put before the students, or is this? Uh, Good question. We taught it actually in a computer lab. So so in this particular case, I requested the math computer lab to teach it in. So we had a computers around the wall, and then a table in the center. So so it was a clear separation between okay, now turn your back to me and work on the computers, or turn your back around and we'll work at the board or on the projector. How hard for the server did you need to host an entire classroom? Yeah, that's a very good question and actually maybe another <coughs> issue for discussion. Um, that changed as of three days ago, the answer to that question. Um, a lot of the notebooks, so one of the huge focuses for the summer is getting the notebook to be much more scalable, uh, lower, lower power, power hardware, working with more number of students. Um, at Drake, I'll just say in general, at Drake we have our own Sage server for more reasons than just, you know, that. Um, and we have a, I think two, we have an old machine a server that was sitting around and nobody was using that I just claimed and they said I could have. And we put a couple of gig of RAM in it, so it's, I think it's got 16 gig of RAM, which is an overkill. Um, and it's a quad uh, core dual processor, so eight cores in total, it's a Dell server from like five years ago. But I think it's an overkill for, uh, my class was like seven. I'm at a small liberal arts university. Drake University. Um, my guess is our computer, after the changes from today, could easily handle, you know, maybe 40 to 80 students simultaneously online. But because of these changes, we don't have a huge amount of experience with this. You know, we aren't sure what the capabilities are now. Um, before now, Sage servers were sort of limited to about 30 to 40 simultaneous users. And this was a limitation of the of the way the, the server was programmed, not a limitation of the hardware. But we've removed some of those limitations. Mike Hansen and Rado and William have been working really hard on removing these limitations, and uh, now things should scale a lot better. So, so, so that's part of the reason why SageMB.org has not been usable for the last year. And the three days ago, it's finally usable again, and uh, we're cracking down to see how scalable things are. That was a long-winded answer to your question. To say that. As of three days ago, uh, you can reasonably expect to host hundreds of students on a on a pretty low cost campus server. You know, a couple thousand dollars. All right. Thanks again, Jason. Take a break and let uh, Jim.